preach to us two passages of scripture that he wanted. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long, and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Then the other passage that he wanted, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for the sweetness of an hour like this when we can celebrate the homegoing of one of your servants and one of our friends. We pause today, our Father, to pay tribute to him as one of our friends and members. We thank you, our Father, for all the happiness and sweetness he brought to so many of us and to so many countless thousands outside of this place. We thank you, our Father, that he lived on the positive side of life, that early in his boyhood he came to know Jesus, and that he lived out that profession as he walked with so many young people. And we pray, our Father, that you would bless his grieved companion today, one who's been by his side through all these years, and who has watched the development of his service to us and to so many. Will you bless her today and bless his whole family and how we pray that your Holy Spirit will follow every good thing that he ever did and bring it into a full harvest in thy way and time. We would pray, our Father, that you would help us all to check on our own lives today, that we would attempt out of this service to make a new commitment to Jesus Christ, the Christ Carl loved and served. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Blackshire must go back to a medical meeting where he is to speak in just a few moments, but he is the doctor who put the instruments in Carl's body and looked him in the face and told him about the reality of his illness. And it was then, as they discussed, how that it couldn't be too many months until this was inevitable. Carl said to him, I want you to sing at my service. And you have heard him sing the song that Carl wanted sung here today. Carl was born in Malvern, Arkansas on September the 5th, 1911. In three months he would have been 70 years of age. He was converted in one of Mordecai Ham's meetings when the great evangelist came here. Mordecai Ham, as you remember, is the one who was preaching when Billy Graham was converted. And Mordecai Ham held that meeting and Carl Ledbetter, a little boy of 12, walked down and gave his life to Christ. He and Margaret were married on May the 3rd, 
1934. And on November the 20th, 1939, a little daughter was born to them, Mary Alice. She died on August the 10th, 1951. And in just a few more weeks, it would have been 30 years since her casket was at this same spot. They joined Emmanuel on promise of their letter from the Central Baptist Church on November the 17th, 1940. And immediately they became active in the church. When I came to this church, I found Carl Ledbetter here. I'll never forget that first Sunday evening. There were 92 here in church training that evening, and he and a group of young people gathered around my desk, which was then in that part of the building. I have a picture of it, and I looked at it this morning, reminding me of that first Sunday I spent here. He was standing by my side, and he'd been standing by my side ever since. He became the chairman, vice chairman of the maintenance committee when Frank Tatum had that responsibility. And then 35 or so years ago, he moved up in to head that committee, and there's where he has worked all through these years. He worked with our boys and girls, we call them intermediates then, and uh, up in that part of the building. And then when we built over here, up above the offices, he would meet with them on Sunday evening, put his arms around them, sing with them, talk to them about Christ. That is just about as great love as he had, the work he did there with them. He took our first group to Siloam Springs, and for 21 years straight, he and Margaret and Dr. Reagan, in those early days, helped us with those young people. And after that first trip, he came back and said, we've got to have a cabin up there. And you remember we built the cabin and used it for many years. And he went to Mr. Moses, head of the power company, and said, don't have any lights up there, I've got to go up there. And he went up there, took his vacation, went up there for two weeks, worked morning, noon, and night, and he put up the wiring, which is now the adequate wiring. He said it's adequate for all time to come. He said, I put up the biggest and best we could buy uh, to wire that assembly. He just loved to do things like that. He worked very diligently in the Kiwanis Club, and especially with our youth program, and fought uh, drugs, I guess, as strong as anybody. In those early days, when the hospital was over here, we had 75 to 100 nurses, member of our church. Carl knew them all by name. Went out to their picnics with them, drove the bus when their choir went out to sing their choral group all over the state. Uh, he and Margaret uh, kind of adopted 14 of these girls and supervised them while they were here in their training. So uh, you see I am in a sea of impossibility trying to talk about the greatness of a man like this who in a humble way, not colleged, not trained in the schools, but trained in the grace of God, lived out his life, had a tragedy early in his life with the power company. It was just by a miracle of God that he didn't die. And over here in the hospital, it's now gone across the street. There he lay for months with a body burned completely, almost burned up. But God knew that all this was coming and by the grace of God, God mended his body, scars which he carried for the rest of his life, got him ready for his work. I was in Cleveland, Ohio with our young people when the news hit me. I didn't believe it. I, I had seen him on Sunday. The last visit I made before I left early on Monday morning was to go to his bed and talk with him a little bit. I thought it would be at least a couple of weeks. Gene McRoberts told me, says, Preacher, he'll go before you get back. I couldn't believe it when the news struck me. And immediately, but for weeks, of course, I'd been trying to prepare my mind. What will I say about this man? I put it down this way. First, Carl Ledbetter was a genuine Christian. That was the driving force of his life. 
Ein Hirim, that young man Christ, who almost 2,000 years ago established a youth movement. You've heard him. How many times he said that? He put his arms around the boys and the girls of this church and loved them. And when he put his arms around the girls, nobody ever saw, saw one gleam of lust in his eyes. He could do it and do it in purity and beauty, and he did. He was a genuine Christian. The second thing I want to say is that he was always on the positive side. I have a picture and looked at it this morning. In 1950, one hot August day, we broke ground on this building that's right behind us. And standing right there by me, Bob Green on one side, Carl Lebetter on the other. He was right there always, always looking for the ongoing of this church. He loved people, all kinds of people. I said to Ron Pace in Cleveland yesterday morning as we were in the van going to the church, what was to you his outstanding characteristic? Oh, he said everybody knows that. He loved people. He loved everybody. He did. Loved all kinds of people. I was visiting Ms. Harris last night, who's in a coma at the doctor's hospital. And Bonnie was there, and we were talking about when Bonnie and Dale and Barbara, their father and mother, lived down here on West 7th. I can see them now, drive right by their house many times. And they joined the church, and then they didn't come much. And Carl would come and say, we've got to get them. we just got to get them. We've got to get those young people. He said, now you help me, because he said, these young people are just too precious for us not to get them. I would suppose his greatest ministry is what we'd call his, his wayside ministry. He kept his tools in his car. And if, if your lights were not working, he fixed the switch and he connected all of the appliances at our house. He put the vent up on the top and he said it didn't wasn't right and he brought a new one and put another one there and how many things he did for us he connected the electric stove and he has done this for you and for you and for you how many of you i call it his wayside ministry this is when he was at his best i would love for him to come for he always brought a rainbow of sweetness to our house every time he came the third thing I want to say is Carl knew how to be a friend. I am rich in my friendship. Most all of you are members of this church, a great many of you. And you are my friend, and I love you very much. But Carl Ledbetter was the best friend I've ever had. I've tried to steal myself so I could say these things today. My mother was at the point of death one midnight, and I called Carl, and I said, Carl, I want you to come and take me to the airport. He said, get a taxi. Bam, put the phone. I called him right back, and I said, Carl, you don't know what I mean. I said, I mean take me to Memphis. Well, why didn't you tell me? He said, I'll be there. And in a few minutes, he was there, and he drove me to the airport in Memphis. He was always doing things for me like that. After the doctor had diagnosed his trouble, he was up here one Saturday. That was his custom. He, I'd hear him in the building. Carl, can I help you? No, I'm just up here to check things out. Want to be sure everything's ready for tomorrow. But on that day, he came in. Well, he said, don't feel too good. I need a transfusion, he said. He came over and put his arm on my, he says, he said, man, that'll carry me for days. He said, we're blood brothers. We were. And he was the best friend I've ever had. One day I came in here and I heard him up in the attic. And I called up there and I said, what are you doing up there? He said, I'll be down in a few minutes. You know these chandeliers hang on chains and they have pulleys up in, and 
He was always afraid. He was checking those. He said, I have the horror if one of those would ever fall in here and when our people are worshiping here. Nothing like that must ever happen. And he came down out of the attic and he had dirt all over him and soot all over him and sweat running all over him. And uh, I said, what in the world are you doing? He said, I'm about to choke to death. He said, there's so many unanswered prayers up there in the attic. He said, I, it's just about to choke me. What a man he was. What a man he was. You know, I came up here late last night and I walked around this building and I thought that every heat I block in it, every brick in it, every window in it was crying out, we loved him too. Next to his wife and next to his daughter, he loved this building above everything. That's why the flags are flying at half-staff out there this morning. This was his shrine. This was his home. He would come up here and find that an air conditioner wasn't working. And he'd work all day. Friend, if you would get up out of your chair and come down here and lay a quarter of a million dollars on this casket, you wouldn't pay him for the hours of professional service that he gave this church. I doubt if in the history of American Christianity, if one man has devoted himself to a building like that man who lies in this casket in front of me. In one of the last things, he was having an intimate talk with Gene. In one of the last things, he said to Gene, Gene, keep my church clean. We're going to try to do it. Every time you see a piece of paper on the floor, you pick it up. If you ever see anybody marking on a wall here, you say you can't do that here. Carl said, keep my church clean. We'll try to do it. When the news came to me of his death, I was up in Cleveland, where we had such a sweet and wonderful week. I'll be telling you about it later on had such marvelous experiences, and I had just come to the church when Miss Swedenberg called me and said they couldn't get you at the motel, and uh, Carl Ledbetter has just died. I quickly left the phone, and I went in the little church, and I picked up the songbook, flipped it open, and I don't know why my eyes fell on that last verse of the song. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Calm is thy slumber as an infant's sleep, but thou shalt wake no more to toil and weep, this is thy perfect rest, secure and deep, good night until the shadows from this earth are cast, until he gathers in his sheaves at last, until the twilight gloom be overpassed. Good night. Until the Easter glory lights the sky, until the dead in Jesus shall arise, and he shall come, but not in lowly guise. Good night. Until made beautiful by love divine, thou in the likeness of the Lord shall shine, and he shall bring that golden crown of thine good night. Only good night, beloved, not farewell. A little while, and all his saints shall dwell in hallowed union indivisible. Good night. Until we meet before his throne, clothed in the spotless robe he gives his own, until we know, even as we are known. Carl, good night.